Oh, I do. But I was entranced by the, by the Ultimate Warrior here. Well, I guess we'll begin then. WWF, WWF, Saturday Night's Main Event, November 26th, 1988. So we open, as always, with a batch of like 30-second promos. And I thought every single one of these promos was just awesome. Just fantastic. The screen comes up, and there's a close-up of just the Ultimate Warrior's eyes, right? And he's got the classic warrior face paint on. And his eyes are bugging out, and he just screams, War! Then it cuts to a wider shot. It cut, It doesn't zoom out. It cuts to a you know, wider shot of Warrior, and he's wide. He's, he's just Well, you know, ultimate. he is a warrior. I never really thought about it before, but his his gimmick is that he is... He is a man of war. Yeah. I don't know what kind of war. I can't imagine him in the Vietnam War, the Gulf War. I don't think that would have gone well. I I don't think he would have been a very effective soldier in that kind of combat. But whatever war he found, uh, he was ultimate at it. He says, I am the ultimate warrior in case there was any possible confusion. I guarantee you, in 1988, if you had never watched pro wrestling before, this lunatic is on your TV screaming at you. You will think, God... This guy's like a like an ultimate warrior. He is the ultimate warrior. He says, this face paint I wear, it is war paint. Some people say that Thanksgiving is a time of peace, but not for me, not when my intercontinental championship belt is on the line. He then addresses his opponents tonight, which, so help me God, is Mr. Fuji and his charge, the Super Ninja. It is 1988 on national television, and we're just throwing random super ninjas out there. So he explains, so he's ranting about war and victory, and to the victor goes the spoils. Mr. Fuji, super ninja, I'm going to spoil your Thanksgiving! And he's beating his chest and ranting his raving. I'm crying laughing. I watched this like eight times. And listen, we'll get to Warrior. There's a lot to say about Warrior. In, in in many respects, but the one thing you can't deny, when he's on TV, you can't take your eyes off him. That's for goddamn sure. Not for one second. You may miss something ultimate going on at any time. I was terrified to look away from the TV when he was on. So the Ultimate Warrior passed away quite a while ago, but I did just go up to his Twitter account because I wanted to find out what he used for a handle. If he was, in fact, at the Ultimate Warrior... But in fact, he was merely at Ultimate Warrior. Wow. Yeah. And 240,000 followers, which you would think that the Ultimate Warrior would have more. But he is following four people, okay. Vinny. The <laughs> Ultimate t- Warrior is following four people. Would you like to guess? I can't just say people, but he's following four. Four accounts. Bri- Brian? Would, would you like to guess any of the accounts? In all sincerity, I am terrified to even guess. Well... He's following Dana Warrior. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. WWE. All right. Steve Wilton, who I believe must have been his manager because it says here, managed Ultimate Warrior. (laughs) Okay. And I'll give you one wild guess. The fourth account that the Ultimate Warrior is following besides his wife, his manager, and WWE. Is it Vince McMahon? C.M. Punk. Oh, you know what? I, I can what? actually see that. I <laughs> how? I, I but I, I how can you see that? Because while they would not see the eye on many things, anything they they did both have a track record of standing up for themselves. Well, I guess and so. I, but I, you know I what? A lot of guys did. Did. Less so uh, in, the, in the past five to ten years. But CM Punk, more than anyone else on the roster at that time, was standing up for himself and, and sticking up for what he believed in. And even though Warrior may not have believed in those same things, he would have respected CM Punk for doing that. I believe. So, I open the show. We then go to a promo with me and Gene Oakland, Mr. Fuji, and as Gene calls him, Super Ninja One. I didn't and know there were two. Up there may be 90. Wow. Who knows how many Super Ninjas there are? So Gene asks Mr. Fuji about Super Ninja 1. And Mr. Fuji actually says on national television, secrecy 
is the key to victory. Remember Pearl Harbor. Ha, 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 ha. We are still talking about Pearl Harbor, which, if I recall correctly, took place in 1939. It is 1988. It's been 50 fucking years. Yeah. So, he uh, says, this man, the Super Ninja One, has trained secretly for seven years on seven continents in seven arts. Remember me, Gene. Pain is silence. Only the screams are heard. What? Fuck if I know. It was actually one of his more lucid promos. I guess. He was very a uh, rotten promo. <laughs> he was like really, really bad at the mouthpiece part of being a pro wrestling manager. So Gene interviews Warrior, who is, of course, shaking and just, like, vibrating the entire time. And he must face an opponent, as Gene says, no one has ever seen. And Warrior is not concerned. There is no face of war I have not looked upon. I have seen my enemies vanquished a thousand times. A thousand! War holds no secrets for me. Only victory! And he storms off, and Gene references D-Day. Because everything has to be talking about World War II here in 1988. Well, we got to talk about this warrior match. Okay. Maybe he was there in World War II, for all I know. So before we talk about this match, and this will make sense, I just have to say, you have not watched any of the G1 this weekend, Vinny? I have not, no. All right, well. I know, I I've, di I know I've discussed it on this show before, and the irony, the amazing coincidence, is that I also mentioned this on the Thursday edition of of Wrestling Observer Live. You remember that swole match that we didn't like? Right, yes. Okay. We're talking about this on the Thursday show, and I went into this big rant about an idea that I had a long time ago about teaching people how to wrestle. And it was about how you get in the ring with your partner, and all you guys are allowed to do is punch. Yes. Or maybe kick. Right. You cannot do any other moves. Mm -hmm. You've got to build a match with only punches or only kicks or maybe punches and kicks. That's all you can do. The shine, the heat, the comeback, the finish. That's the only thing you're allowed to do. And, and so what, Somebody took you up on this. What it'll teach you is to put a match together, structure a match, and not worry about doing a bunch of fucking flips and shit. And you'll get really good at punching and kicking. Also true. Fucking two days after I mentioned this on Observer Live, Kota Ibushi and Taichi get in the fucking ring and they do a 17-minute match that only involves kicking. Yes. Now, the reason I bring this up, besides to talk about what a fucking genius I am, I never saw this match live when it aired. I never saw the Warrior versus the Super Ninja. But for 34 years, I have seen the spot where somebody goes for a front kick <laughs> and their opponent grabs the foot and invariably they throw the foot sideways and then they give them like an atomic drop. Sure. And for 34 fucking years, I have wondered, why don't they just take the foot and throw it up in the air? And the guy will land on his back or on top of his head. And I never saw anybody do it until last Sunday when I was watching Saturday night's main event. And of all people, after 34 fucking years, the guy I finally saw do it was the guy that got me into wrestling 34 fucking years ago. I See? just missed this. See, he 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 might have followed you too if you'd been more famous. Fuck. Yes. He grabbed the Super Ninja's foot and he just threw it in the air. And the and guy Super flew Ninja up in the air and took a bump. Landed on his head. It's true. By the way, before we move on, so I'm sure you've probably already gotten angry emails, but yes, Pearl Harbor was 1941. I'm sorry, it was early. Yes. So. So this match, Ryan, I'm glad you got saw that spot you liked. Uh, this match was rotten. It was really, really bad pro wrestling. The two highlights to me, neither of which involved the actual match, 
Jesse is hyping up the Super Ninja, like the, through all the entrances, the promos, the, the the whole deal. And of course, Super Ninja comes out here and just gets wiped. Warrior sells nothing. And Jesse says, hey, I can only tell you what Mr. Fuji told me about Super Ninja. I guess Mr. Fuji lied to me. And then Vince McMahon says about Mr. Fuji, quote, I don't think that would be the case. He thought Mr. Fuji was trustworthy and honorable. Then Vince gets in the line there. Of course, this will stun you. Vince was a huge fan of the Ultimate Warrior's muscular physique. And he says, comparing this body, Jesse, to yours is like comparing ice cream to horse manure. I thought, really? That's the exact same line that Bobby Heenan used for Ric Flair's belt when he showed up here only like four that's years true, later. That's true, yeah. So that's one, another one of Vince's favorite lines. Uh, Warrior wins this horrible, terrible match. Takes the entire thing. Press slam, splash, wins. So I did not remember an Ultimate Warrior Super Ninja match on Saturday night's main event. And I was certain this had to be a swerve or a trap or something. Like the Super Ninja is going to pull out a stick and attack Warrior and it will be Honky Tonk Man under a mask. But no. He would have sent out there to get beat up and lose. So I looked it up. It was, in fact, Pacific Northwest wrestling legend Rip Oliver. Wow. Under the Super Ninja mask. Wow. Who, Tragically, passed away earlier this year due to heart failure. But there you go. Uh, the, 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 the mystery of Super Ninja 1 revealed here on the Brian Vinny Show. Well, I got one more thing I got to say about this match. I don't want to be here really? all night. But yeah, believe it or not. <laughs> I actually don't. So I'm watching this match, and you know who fucking sucks is the Warrior. He does. God damn, God bless the guy, but he fucking was terrible in the ring, especially at this point. And he was the Intercontinental Champion. And it suddenly hit me that... We've been watching Saturday Night's main event dating back to the very first one. It's been three, four years now. He is the first singles champion that we have ever seen that totally fucking sucks. Yes. I mean, we had Randy Savage and Tito Santana and Ricky Steamboat. And he wasn't the greatest worker, but like the Honky Tonk Man, he was a great character. He knew and, what to do. And he knew what to do. He wasn't yes. rotten. No. But the warrior, oh my God, was he awful. And he was the first guy. Even, well, first, even like Hogan, who'd been champion like Hogan's the entire time. Hogan was so Light fucking years good better. on these Saturday Night's yes. Main Event shows. Yes. And then the belt goes to Randy Savage, who's fucking great. But goddamn, this warrior was a, an, an atrocity in the ring. I mean, of this era, you're exactly right. If you, if you go back in time, Superstar Billy Graham was not anything you want to spend a lot of time watching. There's... No, but at least he was like a fantastic promo and a great he a, character. Oh, he was Warrior's the... just a crazy guy. Warrior is just a lunatic with giant muscles. And Warrior did get better, but like at this point, he, he got... is bottom of the barrel. Yeah, he got much better, and I'm sure part of it, too, was the, the new like four times a year at like Mania and SummerSlam and one or two other big matches, he was going to have to actually have a big match. I'm sure those were planned out well in advance, and a lot of work went into those. They didn't just give him 20 minutes at a finish. I mean, fuck, even like even Nikolai Volkov like knew Way what better. knew what to do, <laughs> but he just really couldn't do it. Yeah. Warrior had no idea what to do. I mean, fucking Rip Oliver. I mean, even he. I didn't know who the Super Ninja was until right now, but now it's even more befuddling. That they totally fucked up some spot. Warrior does this leapfrog, and then they just got totally lost. Like, man, oh, man. Yeah. And, they, and he's a champion. If we, if we went back and watched like maybe some of the hillbillies, they may have been this bad, but I'm not sure. No, they knew what to do. Certainly even, not Jim. Even if they were bad. Yeah. So if you recall, when the Warrior appeared on that show, I said, my God, he's nowhere near as big as he ends up being. <laughs> That's well. How fucking many? I, I guess they did take months and months and months off, and this was like their fall season or whatever. But this fucking guy shows up here, and he is gi fucking gigantic. He was ultimate. Fifty pounds heavier than it was the last time we saw him. It seemed like just gigantic.